Hello and welcome to Comedy Album Book Club. Uh, this is Matt. Uh, this episode I got had the pleasure of chatting with sketch comedy duo Claire Blackwood and Ryan Hughes, also known as Whiskey Kids. You may remember Ryan from the time he appeared on the show previously uh, with Grace Smith to talk about Beth Stelling's Simply the Beth. They joined me in a virtual pizza party uh, to watch the film Easy A. Easy A is a 2010 film written by Burt B. Royal and directed by Will Gluck, starring Emma Stone in one of her earliest leading film roles. It tells the story of Olive Pendergast, a whip-smart and sassy high school student. While studying the Scarlet Letter, she finds herself in a situation mirroring that of Hester P Prynne. She navigates through the trials and tribulations that are thrown at her, ultimately forging her own path. This is a delightful film that has a stacked cast, including Emma Stone, Amanda Bynes, Lisa Kudrow, Thomas Hayden Church, Patricia Clarkson, and the woefully underused Malcolm McDowell, just to name a few. This is one of those rare films that, while aimed at teenagers, it doesn't condescend, and it doesn't immediately make you think that the writer is a 40-year-old man turning his hat backwards and sitting on a chair to look into jam with the kids. As always, we suggest you watch the film before listening to the podcast. It's available on Netflix for easy access. The podcast will be full of spoilers, so you've been warned. Thanks again for tuning in, and welcome to Comedy Album Book Club. Welcome to Comedy Album Book Club. Uh, today I sat with Ryan Hughes and Claire Blackwood and uh, writers, improvisers, actors, and all around just amazing performers. Uh, they make up the duo Whiskey Kids uh, and we watched the movie Easy A. Um, so uh, before we get into the, the actual movie, uh, just to, to tell the audiences a little bit about you, uh, what, what first drew you both to performing and uh, what was sort of like your trigger to eventually like really like go into comedy? Ooh, do you want to take this first, Ryan? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I've, I was one of, I'm one of these lifelong drama kids, you know, I, uh, I've been, I was doing school plays since I was in grade six or whatever. Um, uh, went to theater school twice uh, for two different things. I didn't fail. Um, uh, the, although maybe in a larger sense, I did fail. Um, the, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've been like sort of um, an artsy performing guy for, for forever. Um, and then when I moved to Toronto in 2010 or something like that, you know, all my, my whole theater world was in Edmonton where I'm from. Uh, so I got out here and like any theater scene, it's, it's, it tends to be very insular. It's very hard to sort of break in. Uh, everybody knows each other. Everybody's kind of got all those, those sort of patterns of interaction and, and everything. And, uh, so, you know, I just found, I just found that I, I couldn't be a theater boy here. Um, and I think I was old enough that I felt like I didn't have the energy to like kick in the doors like you gotta do. So I just, I think, I think it was honestly as random as like, I met uh, like a woman who was a stand up comedian at some dinner party. And I went and checked out a couple of stand up shows that she invited me to and met some people and then eventually got into improv and comedy and, and since it's way easier to get comedy off the ground in this town, uh, I just sort of ended up uh, ended up sticking with that. Yeah, um, I think mine was actually like yeah, I was a, I was a theater kid. Um, I had done mostly Shakespeare for most of my career in Toronto after graduating theater school, um, and then Ryan and I wrote a show together for Fringe, um, and then. Honestly, like that was kind of the start of my 
kind of comedy adventures because we just kind of were like, oh, we like working together. Let's start making comedy. And then I, uh, I did the, you know, Second City Conservatory and all that kind of stuff. So it's basically been the last two years, roughly, that I've really kind of gotten more into writing and comedy and all that kind of uh, fun stuff. I, I think, um, kind of apropos to what Ryan was saying, uh, one of the greatest tweets I've ever seen was uh, Kaya Green. I don't remember what the context was, but they basically just said, comedians are just tired actors. <laughs> I haven't heard that, but that's a good one. I and like I that. was like, that is 1000% true and absolutely signified my entrance into comedy, which is just, I got sick of pushing against theater doors that just weren't opening. And I was like, well, fuck you guys, then I'm going to do comedy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, kind of just gone from there. <laughs> And uh, that collaboration on, on that show that you wrote, that, that was, was that the birth of Whiskey Kids? No. Well, I mean, it was the birth of us working together. Yeah. But, like, I don't think Whiskey Kids was about a year. Maybe, about oh, a year. no, about, like, six months later. I think so, yeah. Well, because we, we, cause we kind of knew each other as sort of, like, theater kids. I think we met at, like, some sort of, uh, um, it was like some sort of like commercial audition workshop or something yeah. like that that a casting director was doing. Um, so we knew each other as sort of like these, uh, these you know, uh, soon to be tired actors to borrow Kaya's mm -hmm. phrasing. And, uh, and uh, we'd like run into each other every six months or something. Um, but then, yeah, uh, I think Claire was set to do uh, like a two-hander with another performer that they were going to write together. And then he ended up getting some opportunity. He had to leave town. So suddenly she needed uh, like a, a collaborator for this fringe show with like, was it two months to go or? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we kind of banged out our first show and it went pretty well. And so we just sort of kept, kind of kept yeah. that in. And I, I sort of, I don't know how much of a part I played in this, but I do remember Claire uh, kind of browbeating you into like auditioning for the uh, conservatory program. Well you were absolutely the reason there was, there was why a certain amount of time where you were not you were convinced that like oh, i don't know how to be funny i don't know how to do improv and i don't know i'm like look if they let me in they'll let you in don't worry about it. <laughs> that was that was pretty much it uh yeah and uh so what inspired uh choosing easy a today uh, i think we were honestly just like to be super boring about it i think we were just kind of going through netflix uh and being like, what comedy movies are on there that either we both like or one of us likes and the other person hasn't seen, which is the case for EZA. Um, and yeah, we just we just settled on this one because it was one that we both agreed on. <laughs> well, and I hadn't seen it, but yeah. like I, I'd always heard really good things about it. And I, like, I just like Emma Stone. I, I'm not super familiar with her work. I haven't seen her in a lot of stuff, but I just kind of like her vibe. Please don't tell me that she's a monster. She's um, not, no. she's not, she's great. Yeah. Everything I've heard is he's a wonderful human being. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> So I was, you know, and I'd heard it was a clever movie, and, and then Claire was, like, super into it. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. It's, I've seen Easy A, like, ten times, at least. I, I love it. Yeah. I, I have to, watching this really reminded me, like, what the hell is with California high schools? I know! Like, because, like, every, and, and it's not just this movie. It's, like, every movie I watch where it's about Bring setting it on. up, it's, like, like yeah is they're bigger than york university <laughs> you know like the campuses yeah. are sprawling yeah, yeah. but it, it, yeah so do you have like i'll start with you claire uh since you're more familiar with the film do you have a favorite scene or a favorite moment or performance in in the, the movie i mean i will watch stanley tucci and patricia clarkson play parents literally till the day i die like yeah. they are so friggin' funny and charming, and I mean, I love Stanley Tucci in everything that he does. I think he's brilliant. He's one of my favorite actors, and Patricia is just so wonderful and funny and warm, and like, and I just sit there, and I mean, I have wonderful parents, and I'm sitting there just being like, oh, you guys are the best! <laughs> ah! um, like, yeah, so basically any scene, because I feel like so much, I, I feel like they probably were just like, yeah, you guys just improvised a bit. We'll see what you do. Uh, I feel like a lot of their, their dialogue was probably heavily improvised by them. 
yeah. a lot of those a lot of those cutaway lines of Stanley Tucci is like I kind of feel like those are ones where they just kind of left the camera like that mm-hmm. where he sits down and the, to, to his uh, like a their adopted son and he's so where are you from originally? Oh my god! <laughs> there's no so way. There's no way that was in the script. That was just Stanley Tucci. Yeah. Riffing. Yeah. Riffing. Like, it, 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 the the thing I love about it too is like you know you watch some shows like Gilmore Girls which you know I love you know Mrs Maisel. Uh, where the, 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 like, there's the quippiness to the parents. It doesn't feel forced. Like this no. feels like this could just genuinely be those two people. I mean, it is pretty quip intensive, uh, but sure. it never yeah. feels like oh, this is no parents are like this kind of thing. No, yeah. they're just they're both they both actors have like a very similar lovely warm quality to them that I think I, I you just kind of got the sense that they just love being on set together. At least yeah. I hope they mm-hmm. did. And, oh, and, and, it's, and it's it's a really uh, I mean it's it's a really it's a trick with these kind of movies right because you you have these so often in these movies you have these these teens that are sort of clever and wise beyond their years mostly because they're being written by like 35 40 year olds um, yeah. and this is a kind of a nice way to fold that in because like this is this is exactly the kind of teenage girl that would come into existence raised by two people like that yeah and they all just have like they're all very smart they're all very like sort of they have the same ridiculous sense of humor they've got a, like a high level of reference as they say in comedy so it makes sense to, yeah. i was like oh it's one of these yep. quippy 17 year olds you know and they even kind of established that too in the cutback or, or flashback to the the seven minutes in heaven where it's like how do you talk like an adult like yeah, how do you yeah. do that so it's like it's it there's there's like underpinnings to the narrative it's not just oh she's just a it just doesn't come out of nowhere kind of thing yeah exactly um, yeah. And, and is there a, a performance or scene that really pops for you ryan oh, man i mean this almost seems like the 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 easy a for answer because uh, uh I, I mean, it's Emma Stone, right? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's her movie, uh, you know, and of course, like, she's got the most screen time. She's got, so, like, of course, she's gonna, she's gonna, she has the opportunity to kill it harder than anyone else, but, like, mm-hmm. she kills it twice as hard as that, I almost yeah. feel. Although, I gotta say, I did make a note, um, leaving aside Emma Stone, just because, like, obviously, she's the lead. Every time I see Lisa Kudrow in something, yeah. I feel, because I was a too cool for school teenager when Friends was on the air back in the 90s, and I feel very bad about how dismissive I was of so many of those actors, yeah. especially Lisa Kudrow, because she is such a good actor, comedically, dramatically, she can yep. just walk an amazing dark line, and like, and, you know, and I feel bad that I wrote her off for so many years because I wanted to be cooler than friends or whatever yeah like her meltdowns are just yeah. beautiful to watch because yeah, there's just like great. that the energy and there's it's like a it's, there's like a storm that's being bound up that you just see just below the surface and, mm-hmm. and that and it's just it's, it's it's a delight to watch because it's not it that never strays into it just walks that line between ridiculous and real mm-hmm. really really well and yeah so she's terrific yeah, I, I have to agree though. I, I think Emma Stone was my. I mean, like coming into this movie, she'd only been acting professionally for about five years. By that, she point. was yeah. twenty. She was twenty-one. She was twenty-one. She'd been doing it for five. years. She had six. T- but by that point, it's a heavy five years. She had six TV credits, two of which she was a lead in, and f- seven film credits. But this was, I think, her first, well, like her, oh, well, yeah. her first major film lead where she was the central character. Like, do you feel this is kind of, like, for me, like, watching it, I, I know I do, but, like, do you feel this is kind of where there's the Emma Stone character? This was her star type? maker. This yeah. was her star maker. This yeah. was her movie. So I feel like after this, like, this is, like, people realize, oh, no, this is the yep. person for these types of roles. Yep. Yeah. 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 This was, yeah. yeah. She's got a, yeah, I mean, she's got a... She's got a very specific vibe. That, that quirky, sarcastic, charming girl. Well, and I find that a lot of actors, 
a lot of young actors kind of have that where like they'll be working for a while and they're good and they're fine but it's like there's always that sort of one role or that mm -hmm. first time that the first time that they're like lead, a lead in something where they finally like you've just something drops in and you just see that oh this is this is their thing you know? I remember this was the first movie in my entire life that I watched and I was really angry that I didn't get cast in her role. It was, <laughs> it was the first time that I was like, oh my God, this part was made for me. Uh, like I could ever be Emma Stone. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, it's a perfect, perfect vehicle for her. And then you have Amanda Fiennes, who I yep. love playing a character that like she doesn't normally play yeah she does it so well like it's yeah. like there's she's it, very yeah. funny yeah like there's a higher power that will judge you for your indecency like <laughs> yeah. uh, no capital yeah no well because i i when i when i was going to playwright in school in montreal um there was like there were two english-speaking channels on the television uh and one of them was YTV, and they would run a lot of like mm. these sort of like Nickelodeon style sitcoms aimed at, aimed at sort of tweens and teens. And Amanda Bynes was in one of those, and I think it was kind of her breakout thing. It was like, yeah, yeah. What I Like About You, or maybe yeah. that was just the name of the, that was the theme song of the. Oh, no, I, I think that was also, the, I think it was also yeah, what it probably. was called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I remember like watching that, and that show was not great, and, but like, she was very good in it and i remember yeah, thinking yeah. like oh this this girl is pretty cool and then but she was always kind of she played kind of mm -hmm. goofy goofier versions of the emma stone kind of thing usually yeah. and then it, it was really interesting to see her as, as kind of a sympathetic villain in this one yeah yeah which is not i don't think i've ever seen her do that nope. outside of this movie no, I think she retired from acting after yeah. watching yeah, this movie. Yeah, that's true too. as well. Yeah, because, um, yeah, I think she was like, I don't, I don't know the logic, but it's just, and it it's, it's kind of a shame because she is really great in this, and it shows there's some, there's a range to her abilities beyond that that one sitcommy kind of character that she. Well, had. it was because uh, her childhood was such a fucking mess because. Yeah. Uh, that she basically had a mental breakdown. So yeah. fun story for everyone listening. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's Very not. Uh, sad. Yeah, yeah, she's not. She's she she's got a lot of stuff to deal with, and, yep. and it seems like she is dealing with it, which is good. But it, yes, it's, it's yeah. sad that it kind of derailed what I thought was a pretty good career. Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, she's the man. Is like my favorite guilty pleasure movie of all time. Like I I can I know it by heart. It's perfect. Now, um, watching it, I found, like, th for a movie that's so heavy in references uh, to pop culture and stuff, it's interesting because it, I, it feels like it really, in to me, it inverts the manic pixie dream girl trope. Like, it takes it and turns it on its head in a way. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, like, this was filmed and released in 2010, which I kind of feel like looking at the types of movies that came out and like just preceding it and then after it, it was sort of like the peak manic pixie dream girl movie era, you know, like 500 days of summer and, and all of that jazz. So where if you have a, a sharp quirky character, but instead of making it an aspirational target, instead of Emma Stone being the aspirational dream girl of a male protagonist, it's actually throwing, showing it through her eye, like her perspective and, and and olive's perspective and mm -hmm. and sort of like just saying like no this is bullshit these people have agency like i feel it it gave agency to these types of characters that were often mistreated interesting yeah i i would almost disagree with your like with the crux of that point in the sense that i don't think this was ever supposed to be related to those kind of female characters whatsoever because it completely just like defies what those characters are like i don't think there's an opposite of a manic pixie dream girl because i think manic pixie dream girls are a very specifically constructed thing for a very specific purpose like they're they're meant to be the like love interest of a male driven film and exist for no other reason than that as opposed to i just think that this is a movie that's just a strong female lead uh 
Yeah, like I, I'm kind of with Claire on that one. Uh, okay. I, I'm not, yeah, like, I mean, I think she's definitely a subversion of a type that you would see. And I almost feel like, I mean, all the John Hughes references, I think, are, yeah. are in this movie are really, uh, are, are kind of a good sign pointer to that because I do sort of feel like, I mean, I know that uh, all of the character really idolizes John Hughes. There we differ, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, the guy made the guy made a good movie, but you know, some of that shit ain't aged well. Um, yeah. I kind of almost feel like Olive is, if anything, she's an inversion of like the Ali Sheedy character in The Breakfast Club. Mm. Um, okay. Which is not quite Manic Pixie Dream Girl because that's what that's a bit of a darker sort of vibe, right? Yeah. Like, because Ali Sheedy is sort of playing this kind of like fucked up. The rumors say she's like the school nympho. She's, mm-hmm. you know, she's there's a kind of weird fucked up gothy thing. But in The Breakfast Club, like in so many of John Hughes's movies, she's such a type. She's just a type, and and I kind of feel like. Um, and we do get to know her a little bit in the Breakfast Club, but even then, everybody there stays the type in a weird way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas with Easy A, I think it's the same kind of character, but as you said, seen from the inside, yeah. where like it's like this sort of the school, for lack of a better term, like put this in quotes, like the school slut or whatever, yeah. um, like the, the fucked up slutty girl or whatever. And it's, but we're seeing it from her point of view, and we're seeing that she's a fully formed human being. So yes, I do believe there is a subversion there. I think it's maybe a different type. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and like the thing that I find is it, it acknowledges the filmic framework, like right from yeah. the get-go yeah, where yeah. she's like, you know, oh, and like how, how, how many movies start with this, this like, yeah. woe is me, teenager, teenager kind of thing. And yeah, the, the, I mean, in a lot of ways it apes the form in an interesting way, like especially with like John Hughes films. Like I was when I were watching it last night, I was talking to Heather and I was like, oh, every one of these guys she's mentioning is kind of a monster in a way, if you go back sure. to the film and look at it now. And she's like, just let me have Jake. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, okay, I'll lay off a Jake, but the rest of them are jerks. Jake's still a jerk too, really, when you deconstruct everything. But yeah, it's it's funny because it's, it's like holding up the aspirational elements but it's still acknowledging the problematic elements of the source material that it sure. draws inspiration from um now so uh this was will uh gluck's f- first film or second film that he directed i mean he'd done a lot of production stuff uh prior to that in tv and bert v royal this was his first screenplay to make it to stage he'd had a, a he'd done a fringe play that received a lot of positive press that's the the or and a glad award um but one of the things i find really interesting looking at the performances of everything in this is there's like a a humanity to to all of the characters like mm-hmm. the, yeah there's like there's sharp like like I mentioned earlier, like sort of Mrs. Maisel or Gilmore Girls, he backs and, back and forth, but it never feels like cartoonish. You don't get quiplash that you can get from watching like either of those shows. Any um, any any Sherman Palladino joint. Yeah. yeah, and I mean I love them, but they, they you go in, it's like nobody talks like this. It's Gilmore Girls, Gilmore yeah. Girls is like good God, normal humans don't talk like this. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you feel like? How do you like? Do you? The, the dialogue do you feel like it that that kind of pace elevated the humor or or how do you feel it impacted the 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 delivery there i mean i think it's i think it's sharp and smart and like it i i, I, I you're aware that it's a script you know a screenplay i don't think you can't not it's a comedy it's a teenage comedy but like it never takes me out of it because I think they just hired a bunch of really good actors who are capable of making it their own. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, yeah, I do. And it's a bit elevated. It's a bit stylized, obviously, mm-hmm. like like so many teen comedies are. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that if it's done well. Um, and in this case, I think it is. And also, I think just because of the subject matter, it's probably very necessary in yes. this case because... Because like this, the story of a the story of a young woman in high school 
who whose reputation suffers because of like rumors of promiscuity that's some heavy awful shit in real life yeah like mm-hmm. it's really terrible scarring things that can really truly wreck someone's life um because we live in a horrible society um so i think that yeah it, it probably to address the things that they were getting at in this movie it was probably necessary to heighten all of that so that it like so that you can kind of soar over all of the the real dark stuff so that you can actually look at the sort of bigger ideas that they were looking at you know um without getting bogged down in like people's trauma yeah yeah i i remember about halfway through the movie i kind of went on line and because i didn't know who wrote the movie and i was like i wonder i assumed it was a man because i just kind of all assumed that holly feature films are written by men but mm-hmm. like um i was like i wonder if a woman had a hand in writing this she did not uh there are a few points where i feel like it would have been helpful um but not very many i think for the most part they did a pretty smart job with it yeah pretty 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 tapped into the humanity of everybody mm-hmm. yeah um, i mean this is off of a first viewing um but yeah i didn't catch anything where i was like Ugh. i i really wish they could have laid off um i wish they could have laid off all of the the horror stuff a little bit more that's, yeah that's a little i don't know i kind of feel that that's not i mean you know it's a way that shitty teenagers talk and it's a way that shitty people talk so like there's that but i don't know it's tricky because it's not quite what they're actually talking about yeah and i think and i think in the last money's the water yeah and th- in the last 10 years we've gotten a lot, i think you know shitty people still do talk like that but i think we've gotten oh, yeah. better about how we address these things so i what i find interesting is if, i think if they did this film now you wouldn't have 21 year olds playing all of these teenagers you'd have teenagers playing all of these teenagers because like that's that i think I don't know about yeah. that. Most teenagers that I know of I mean, uh, in these kind of films and stuff and TV shows are still played by mid-twenties. Well, it's tricky because I think especially like in the 80s with like the sex comedies and stuff like that, mm-hmm. a lot of the reason that, that the characters were cast older was so that they could film yeah. these actors in sexual situations with one another. Whereas, like, if your actors are 16, 17, that becomes, like, a, a problem and also, like, kind of a danger. It becomes a safety yeah. issue in a lot of yeah. ways. So, but, you know, this is also, I mean, this is a story where not much actually happens that's on true. The camera. Like, it's yeah, all true. imaginary. Like, all of, the, all of the sex in this is pretty much imaginary. That's true. That, that gives it more license. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, like, if you look at um, Booksmart, where they cast, I mean, that being said, I guess when trying to do the math on Booksmart, I think they probably would have, like, every, like, the teenagers were all real, like, the cast of this were all, like, 20, 21, except for the one guy where they, they notably mark, oh, he's failed four Damn. times. Cam, sweet Cam Gidgenet is so good. Yeah. He's, so, he's so bland unless he's playing dumb. Like, like, unless he's playing that kind of character. And I was actually pleasantly surprised because I've seen him, I mean, he's been in Twilight and he's been in Burlesque, AKA The Greatest oh, of the Time. Is that, and yeah. Is that yeah, actor, yeah. he's like a known quantity? Because he, he just uh, seems like, he just seems like such a, like a, like a third bill was in two movies 20 years ago sort of guy. You know? I mean, he was in that time period. I think he started to become kind of like the it guy and then like he just kind of never really went anywhere. Uh, okay. But this is like by far my favorite performance of his because he just got to play like a dumb Christian dude. Yeah. Who, like, and I liked it. I thought it was fun. Yeah, he's funny. Yeah. It, it is, it, what I found funny too is like you have one actor who is in um, Twilight and they reference Twilight. You have an actor who was in gossip girls and they're and they reference gossip girls so it's like i, I almost wonder it's like if there is a conscious decision to, to oh, because probably. It's, that is like that's a bit of a coincidence once mm-hmm. sure but like two three times where you're referencing the same people um is that where is that where Penn badgley is from it's mm-hmm. gossip girl yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, i was so in love with him 
my, I, I, I got to bring this up because I, this is my one of my favorite tweets that ever happened. Um, this is uh, Meredith Cheesebro, Toronto comedian. Uh, she's a member of Tall Sai, the sketch duo. Um, one of my absolute favorite tweets is one of hers, and it is literally just, I'm quoting Meredith Cheesebro here, Penn Badgley sounds like a name a guy made up while a cop was writing him a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a very accurate observation. <laughs> yep. Uh, now, um, the movie is very reliant on um, pop culture, uh, you know, and and referential humor. I mean, Scarlet or referential uh, writing. I mean, Scarlet Letter yeah. for all of struggle with identity. And there's the adventures of Huck Huckleberry Finn, uh, tying back to Brandon, where there's like a funny sort of like they play with the timeline because. Technically, she goes, like, when she references, oh, my apologies to Mark Twain, but she is, that's her fourth wall breaking because she mentioned that in the video chat, which is technically taking place after that. So it's sort of like, right. again, playing mm. with the, the structure. Yeah. Um, um, now, you your own material is very referential and pop culture um, laden i mean like there's the i, I know if you're your your um sketch fest show there's the framing device of the video game that, that you used yeah they're deconstructed those those tropes and, and your sexy plague doctors sketch which is hilarious um so but it's, it's like it feels like it's a fine line between like how how referential do you go so how do you balance that like I, the film does it really well i never feel lost watching the film like I, always no, feel, no. I can see it so how do you when you're writing your sketches how do you balance like how deep to reference how far to go and 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 how to how to ba balance that out <laughs> uh, uh, i mean i think we generally do about like a third pop culture sketches most of our sketches come from like things that we find in our lives that are either like anxieties or worries or fears or things that we uh, are annoyed by or or stuff like that and then we'll throw in some nerdy stuff um because it often coincides with our mutual interests or my yeah. or stuff like that well and we're like i mean we're we're nerds i mean you're yeah. more of, i feel like you're more of a nerd than i, I am more of the nerd yeah i'm well, bigger yeah, nerd. like you know i'm from that world i i mm -hmm. I, I, I speak nerd yeah, yeah um, I, I wasn't like, hey, Ryan, I want to do this video game opening. And you're like, what's a video game? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, and I think the thing is as well that is that, I mean, yes, I do think that that's uh, an element of our, of our sort of vibe uh, currently. Um, I do feel like some of that had to do with just, I think the more comfortable we get with each other, just as like collaborators or whatever, I kind of feel like, we're dropping that a little bit and it's we're allowing things to get a bit more personal and a bit more mm -hmm. sort of emotionally grounded than than because I think I think what happens a lot of the time in comedy is that you know you meet someone you want to work with them um and then there's this kind of period where you're sort of feeling each other out even if you like each other even if everything's fine you're getting along you know which I think has always been the case with us um where like so many collaborations in comedy just fail like they just they just you know they trail off or they don't work or they they work really good for two shows and then you know somebody you know somebody gets in something popular and then you can never schedule rehearsals or whatever so I think people are kind of initially on guard and and so I think a lot of the stuff you pitch is a bit more arm's length and is a bit more dependent on pop culture and dependent on like it's kind of stuff you can put out there without any risk to yourself, any sort of personal risk. And I think that we, I think as we've established the fact that, you know, like this is a long-term collaboration, I think that we've gotten better at just sort of like, well, no, let's, you know, let's, let's do sketches about things that make us sad, you know? Yeah, I, I think there, there came a point where we were starting to get a reputation of being like, we were the nerdy troupe. And I was like, I don't want to be that. I mean, like, I think most of the fa most of the times that, like, when our sketches have nerdy kind of references, it's literally just because they're a part of either of our lives. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'll sit around and be like, hey, you know what bugs me is how inaccurate, like, 
CSI TV shows are. Let's make yes. something about that. We never sit down or like, oh, all right, what nerdy things can we skewer today? It's just, I mean, no, like, true. like all comedy, it's just kind of coming from like uh, things in our lives that have inspired us or made us laugh or make us angry. So like, I don't think it's ever a conscious choice. It's like, yeah, no. like it's, it's kind of just pulling from the good and the bad. Well, and to bring it back to Easy A, uh, I think that the reason that I think that the reason that you know the viewer doesn't get lost in the in the references is it's the same it's the same reason that you know uh, a really highly referential show like Community Works or like it, it, so that it, that it's not yes those references are there yes they're sort of providing some of the grounding but it's more important that it work on its own. And that, and that the references be just sort of like bonus texture. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like Easy A it does that really well. Even if you know nothing about Nathaniel Hawthorne, even if you know, like, if you're just watching it and you think this is like a pure story that's like made up from whole cloth and doesn't come from anywhere, you can still follow it. It still makes sense. There's still emotional investment in it. And, and I kind of feel like, that's maybe how we come at that stuff in our comedy as well is that like, great, let's do uh, a CSI thing or let's do, but like, let's make sure that there's something personal there. Let's make sure that there's, yeah. that it's not just like a TV joke, you know? You, you have to take care of your audience. And I think this movie does it really well. Like even, yeah. you know, um, I don't know John Hughes. Like I, I've seen the breakfast club once. Like I, I don't, care for it I mean it's fine um but like all we needed was the <coughs> shot of the guy in the lawnmower to be like oh and now I get this reference okay yeah. cool like you don't need to be I think they they were clever and they gave us a lot of references that like if it meant something they'd set it up and they'd let us know why yeah yeah and one of the things I find really I li like about this film is that like it threads a needle between some positive and problematic representation, um, <coughs> but it always seems to land on the side of empathy with yeah. these characters. Even like the evangelical group, which watching and like in, in, in a lesser film would just be straight up monsters. It establishes an emotional core to these villains. You know, they're they're, they're the villains. They're the, the antagonists mm -hmm. so it, it gives them humanity which i think is missing in a lot of, of yeah. films like this you know absolutely like, yeah and uh, like so did, did you feel that like that um compassion is an important part of the of making these comedies really work i think i think especially for this film it has to be when you're writing a movie about a teenage girl dealing with the stuff that she's dealing with. Like, I think this kind of movie could have gone very, very wrong uh, in the wrong hands and in less compassionate hands. Like, there are even some moments in it, you know, when, she's, when she says, you know, everyone hates me. I'm starting to hate myself too. I'm like, ooh, let's unpack that. Oh, we're not going to? Okay. Like, like I want to know why, what exactly, you know, what she's doing, why she hates herself for it. Mm. Uh, like, because I think it does a pretty good job of um, painting her in a really positive light. And, um, but I think the, the older we get and the, and the smarter we get about talking about these things, there, I, I would have liked to have seen the film address the stigma around the concept of slut yeah. mm -hmm. a little bit yeah. more. Because at yeah. the end of the day, it's still a bad thing in this yeah. film. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, it was, that was the one thing that I'm like, oh, I wish that there had been a female writer uh, on this film because I would have appreciated maybe like trying to see them delve and have that conversation as opposed to her, you know, she does the sexy montage where she kind of embraces it, but at the end of the day, oh, she's not, she's not, she's not, she's not, she's not, she's not sleeping with these people. Like, it's okay, it's okay, it's not happening. She's not a slut. Like the closest we get is Patricia Clarkson in that lovely moment in the car where yeah. she's like, oh yeah, I slept with everybody. I was a giant slut. And I'm like, but like, why do we have to, let's, I wanted them to unpack it and they never did. And I think that to me watching this, cause I haven't seen it for a couple of years. Um, that was the one aspect of the film that I wish that they'd explored more. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think if, it, for me, I think if that film was maybe made today, I, it might have been more comfortable with with addressing those issues. I don't know. I think we're. I, I'm finding that films are get films today seem to be better at doing that with these younger audiences kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the other things I found interesting it's like 2010. Uh, so it was released in 2010. It's in a lot of ways it embraces um information technology as a plot of like as, as a, a device within the film in an interesting way like facebook is name checked you have phones um uh and as for people texting is their their actual you know plot devices are not just something some like oh these kids in their phones it's it actually keeps um moving keeps the story moving forward uh now do you feel that that's possible that it could date the film in any way like do you think that like when when using something of the moment like that um do you think there's a risk to potentially like make it inaccessible down the road or i don't think so i mean we i mean the film is already dated itself in having phones that flip yes so i mean well like... and, and and then netflix being a series of dvds that come to you in the mail yeah. <laughs> the family Tucci is flipping through at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. I, I. I. mean, my short answer is no. Um, I mean, I think uh, like no, and yes, like yes, it is dated, but I don't think that's a detriment. I don't know how you uh, avoid that. And social bullying, if anything else, like social media bullying, is even more uh, of a problem than it used to be. So, if anything, this was just the start. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, it, technology is always going to date a thing, but it, it doesn't, a movie, a movie can, a movie can be of a time and still not date it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, there are great movies from the 50s that are obviously, all those cars are 1950s cars, and the only way that people can remotely communicate is by the phone. And But if it's a good story and it's a good movie, Everyone yeah. just kind of goes, ah, well, it was the 50s. That was, and that's, that's all you need. Yep. Um, yeah. So, like, I mean, I kind of feel like, yeah, technology is always going to date, but, a, like, a, a good story doesn't date. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, and I, th I think that comes back to the emotional core. Like, there's a genuine compassion for all of the characters in this. Uh, it's, it's, like, one of the things, as a, uh, a side note uh, kind of shit. one of the funny things I found is like all of all of Olive's family uh, are named after food so you've got oh, really? Chip Chip is her, her oh, little brother I missed that. I Rosemary, missed that. Rosemary is her mom and Dill oh. is her dad ah! in the script I read her older brother's name is Kale she has an older brother? That that oh, right. George, yes, she does. Yeah, yeah. he's in university, and he, originally he was in in it, and they cut his character, but it was, it, his name was Kale. Oh my god! And one of the things is when when Todd. Uh, that's just that's just a writer fucking around. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> but, but, I, that, but watching it just now, I was like, oh wait a second. The moment that she f lets Todd into her life. She she is right after the lobster hat, and she starts calling him Lobster, lobster Todd. Lobster Todd, yeah. So it's like this through line of the people that she can truly trust are all food based. <laughs> it's just I just found like such a weird little thing there for a moment. It's like, and like yeah, it probably was just the the writer having having fun with that, but uh, it's playing a little game like, with himself while he's yeah. in a final draft. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, um, the father's, the father's I, original name was Turkey, and then they changed it. <laughs> yeah. I did. I did want to say um, before I forget this. I think you're right. I think that. I think that um, a great thing about the script is that it does sort of always come back to the humanity of everybody. Mm -hmm. But then also, nobody's a saint. Like that was the no. other thing I really mm -hmm. loved. Just that, like, like, like. Uh, oh God, I can't remember his name. Her, her friend. Her gay friend. That Mary, she oh, oh, um, yeah. Brandon. Brandon. Brandon, yeah. Brandon um, you know, has that, that beautiful moment where he, like, basically, like, begs her to pretend that she slept with him. And, and you, just, you just see, like, the, the raw pain of being, like, 
like a gay kid in high school and and just the and I, he never says it but you get the feeling that he's on the edge of being suicidal like yep. yeah and and like they go there and you feel it and the reason that you know and it's a big enough it's a big enough crisis that she feels she needs to respond to it and it makes sense but then like he fucking turns around and sells her out to all like the losers of the school yeah, yeah. yeah. and it doesn't but it doesn't like it doesn't take away the fact that that's where he is, but then it's also like, he's also not a saint or Lisa Kudrow's character, right? Like she, yeah. she, like she did a fucked up thing. She slept with a student, like whether, whether he was of age or not, that's fucked up. Um, and, but you see where she's coming from and you know why she did it. And, you know, Emma Stone has this, this moment of, of compassion for her and then it bites her in the ass later. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. And it's like so nobody's a saint, but also nobody's just like a straight up monster. Like I, I really enjoy that kind of storytelling. Uh, yeah, and then it, it's I just find throughout is like every character there's a, an emotional depth to them. Like even the, I'm forgetting the name of uh, the char- the character, but the no Mr. Griffith, I think it is the te- the, yeah. the teacher Thomas Hayden Church's character. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Hayden Church's it's character. Great. Or it's just like I we've all had that that teacher who's like trying to be cool, and every once in a while they were a little <laughs> bit cool. But then I'm then, not. I'm not gonna rap. I'm not to stop that. Yeah, yeah. Remember, Earth Day's tomorrow. Okay. Oh my god, <laughs> that was so, a beautiful line. So yeah, good. such a beautiful example of subtext. I yeah. love it. Yeah. I also forgot that Fred Armisen in this is in this movie. Uh, yeah. And he's so funny for like the thirty seconds he's in there. Yeah. The yeah. second the second time she knocks over the framed picture on his desk and his reaction is just come on. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the dumbest thing and it's perfect. I know. Um you know, are before we start wrapping up and everything, are there any moments or or perf- anything that you wanna maybe highlight um uh, before we wrap up for the, the film? I mean, it just goes back to your original question. Anytime Stanley and Patricia are on on camera, like anything that they do, like when they're like, uh, you kind of look like a stripper, but a high class stripper for governors and athletes. <laughs> it's my favorite line in the whole film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot, a lot going on in that line. Oh, it's um, so good. Uh, I did like, uh, I did like Lisa Kudrow's line about, um, Oh, the student brought a knife to school. I mean, it was a butter knife, but that is a gateway knife. (laughs) Like, there are just, and there's a thing I, like, some of the lines are so out there absurd like that. And it's really, I think it's a real testament to the actors that they, like, grounded everything enough that that you kind of don't notice how whacked out some of that dialogue is. Yeah. Yeah, like, like, if you watch Superbad, they're great performers, and but the dialogue is so bananas they can't save that from just feeling like a silly, a silly movie. Whereas this film, you know, around the same time, uh, one of the same performers, and just they're able to take dialogue that's super silly and just give it heart. That is like I can see this coming from a genuine place in that moment. Like if yeah. that, if I was with that person and this was real life, I could see that coming from that person and not never feeling sort of fake and filmy yeah. um now do you think this is a uh, an important film like a film people really should try to watch i mean i always want people to watch easy a i love the fact that todd the character is there to be essentially like the supportive boyfriend he plays i find that his role is very feminine mm-hmm. um in the sense that like he he he's just kind of there to support her uh and like there to make her dreams kind of come true and I like that about him and I and I like that he is he asks her before he does anything like and he's like like he does everything that he's supposed to uh and he's also just there to be pretty uh and I think this (laughs) like this film does a lot of interesting things with with gender roles I think uh which I really like so I mean I always want people to watch EZA I think it's very smart Uh, I mean I mean it's important to change the world. Yeah, I mean, important's a hard term to mm-hmm. to figure out, right? Because, like, I mean, I don't know if there's any sort of, of 
I don't know if there's such a thing as objective importance, like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like I think maybe a movie like, sure, like maybe a movie like, uh, like Selma or something might be like mm. just across the board important. But I find movies are more, are more often important sort of contextually. Um, I kind of feel like this is a movie that, uh, you know, if the right young person in the right situation saw it, it might be very important to them. Um, yeah, like I don't like. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a very silly, cleverer than average teen comedy for sure. Yeah. Um, it, it's worth watching. I think people should watch it. I mean, Emma Stone's great. The writing's fun. Um, you know, a few things have aged a little. Mm -hmm squickily but like you know uh there's nothing monstrous going on in it i don't <laughs> think and, it, uh, and yeah like i don't know it, it's worth a watch and it's it's an interesting very humane sort of look at at the sort of trauma of sort of sexuality in high school mm -hmm. i don't know yeah yeah one of the things i i like about it is that it never like even when Emma Stone's character when Olive was talking about the sex that she pretended to have at the very beginning it kind of cuts away in a way it it fades out and doesn't it uh, a voiceover so you yeah. never really have that you know it, it it it's like there's no explicit moments really there's that it's all about the heart of the characters so yeah, yeah I mean I I, I I agree and I mean important is a very subjective term uh so i mean i i mean i i think as something i definitely recommend because of that where it's like you want to see a movie where where characters have heart watch this movie uh and that treats treats the subject matter in in a delicate sense from 2010 yeah kind mm -hmm. of thing so. and also and i mean also on top of that all like to just get back to like it's it's function as a comedy it is legitimately very funny a yes. very funny. funny movie yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, last, well, two, two last wrap-up questions for you. So I asked this of, a, of my guests, because uh, like, we've all had different performance experiences, uh, you know, comedy and, and, and drama for, for you both. What is your most bananas, like, crazy experience performing? Like, could be, like, situational, location. Like, I had one person who performed in, at a nude beach, uh, another who did a bachelorette party, like did comedy. So what, as far as like perform, and it doesn't necessarily have to be location, but experientially, what is your str strangest, most funny bananas performance experience? I mean, I've twice been hired to get really drunk and perform Shakespeare. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I've, I've played Juliet and Beatrice from Much Ado But Nothing in full stage productions where I, my whole purpose was to get shittered and do the entire play. I, I think that counts. Yeah, yeah. It's... For a was theater this, company. Was, the, was this question being asked back the last time I did the show, Matthew? No, no, no. Okay, yeah. because, because if it had, I would have already told this story, but since this is a new question, I can tell this story. <laughs> um, I was in a play in 2007 or something like that in Edmonton uh, is a British, uh, the British sort of late 60s uh, comedy playwright, uh, Joe Orton, uh, is a sort of a very controversial at the time figure, uh, uh, as openly gay as I think you could get in the late 60s in England. Um, wrote a very strange farce called What the Butler Saw. And, oh, I, yeah. and I played the, uh, the the sergeant, the sort of cockney sergeant who shows up like halfway through to sort of cause even more trouble. It's a farce, so there's lots of in and out of doors and people mm -hmm. being mistaken for other people and people wearing each other's clothes and being mistaken for those people because nobody's looking any deeper than the uniform and <laughs> all that all that kind of stuff. And uh, the the sort of climactic moment of the play uh, in this production that was directed by amazing Canadian director Ron Jenkins was uh, uh, the skylight in the ceiling 
opened up, like just sort of fell open and this like blaring white light just sort of shines down into the into the sort of room that the whole play happens in. And Carmina Burana uh, by Orff starts playing like that. Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh, boom, that song. Um, and then this huge silver ladder just gets sort of lowered into the, into like this gleaming silver ladder in this blinding white light. And then my character climbs down the ladder. Um, what? My character climbs down the ladder in uh, like a skin tight leopard print dress. Uh, and a giant like Wilma Flintstone red beehive wig covered in blood oh my lord and then just sort of uh, climbs down the ladder while Carmina Burana is blaring and all the other characters are all in their underwear at this point cowering below me um, and the, every night every night the crowd went nuts it was like a rock concert for a second <laughs> just because just it was so out there and it was so it start the play starts and it's just this this everybody's it's very sixties British, it's very stiff, it's very everybody's being very British. And then as the play goes on, like it gets to the point where everybody's shooting at each other and covered in blood and in their underwear and it's like so it's just this complete collapse of society, right? And it's so they were ready for it at that point and it was like I was like every time I did it, I was like, I will never get an entrance this good again. Uh, and I, I have and I haven't <laughs> I can't believe I've known you for like over three, well, I mean like really known you for three years uh, and I've never heard that story. Well, this was years ago. I mean, this was like 13, 14 years ago. No, so. I'm just saying like I'm shocked yeah. it's never come up. So now you have to write something where, where Ryan gets to enter to like bombastic music covered in blood. In Great. A yeah, see, I've already done it. it would have I've already to done that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> Our next sketch show is going to be insane. <laughs> uh, okay, well, if people wanted to um, read you, read you or watch you perform online, where where can they find you? Uh, Claire gets very regularly published at the Beaverton. She's one of the writers for the Beaverton. Yeah, I would say I would say for myself, follow me on Twitter at Claire Blackwood. Uh, the Whiskey Kids are at um, at those Whiskey Kids, I think, on yeah. Twitter. Those um, whiskey kids, yeah. Yeah, or you can find us on Facebook as well. Excellent. Uh, but Ryan, Ryan, where are you mostly? I am mostly unemployed and looking for a day job. No, um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, I'm at those whiskey kids. I'm at like uh, on uh, my socials. They're like Ryan F Hughes, all one word. Uh, come check me out. I I post intermittently. <laughs> and I'm on Twitter too much. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And, uh, and thanks for listening to Comedy Album Book Club. Well, yeah, thanks thank for you. having us.